Somebody can now be clear of SIBO, but they're still symptomatic. But when you get that lactulose breath test back and it says, well, the SIBO's gone, there's no hydrogen, methane, you know what I mean? Those are negative, but they still are having trouble. Now you have to go look for celiac disease, food sensitivities, gastroparesis, if they're still not emptying, Lyme disease, whatever it is. But you can clear those gases and people can still feel bad. I think it's really important to make sure that we're testing in between and not just going off symptoms. And early on, I was guilty of the same thing. It's like, oh, you're a textbook case for SIBO. But just last week, I saw a negative lactulose breath test, but a lot of dysbiosis in the large bowel. Well, she doesn't need the SIBO treatment. She needs to work on her large bowel. And, you know, they're not the same. Hey folks, it's Mike Mutzel here with HighIntensityHealth.com. Thanks so much for tuning in. Today, we're going to talk about SIBO and farm living with nutritionist and functional medicine expert, Tracy Kanoski. She went to Bastyr University to get her master's degree back in 1998. So she's been doing this for quite some time. She's got a great story. She's been following the SIBO research and helping uh, her clients overcome small intestinal bacteria overgrowth. So we're going to learn about that and also her life on the farm. So Tracy, thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me, Mike. I'm Honored to be here. Thank you. To know each other through an online course that we that we did, um, you know, this spring. And so, I would love for you to maybe start off with your clinical practice and share with our listeners uh, your life and your life out in Montana on the farm and kind of what's what that's like. So uh, after Seattle, I, I am I'm a native Montanan, so I moved back to Montana. I had a uh, face-to-face private practice. And five years ago, I just went 100% virtual. And we live out in the country a little, which you know. Um, and I really, I had traveled a lot before I moved here. And when I moved here, I really, I didn't even want to drive 30 minutes to go to downtown Billings, which is our biggest city. And so I hired a business coach and said, I want to work from home. And she said, I think you can do it. And she said, I think you can be 100% virtual. And I really spent the first year thinking I'd end up at Walmart, Mm -hmm. um, that this just wasn't going to work. And now I have a full thriving private practice. And we do live on this little farm. So we have um, cows, uh, beef cows, not dairy. And so we calve every spring and we have, we just got into chickens and we have a horse and we have goats to try to manage the property without, with as few chemicals as possible. So the goats, they're supposed to eat the weeds, but, um, you know, (laughs) they don't always do that. (laughs) Horses and they follow the horse around and they've kind of become just small horses and they want to eat grass and Hey, thank you. But, um, it's all really fun. And, um, I'm really, really blessed that I can have the the life I want. You know, we have a huge garden. Uh, my husband's passionate about all this. So he's out there growing blackberries and asparagus and learning about ladybugs for, you know, bug control. And he's just really on board. And so we are doing our best to raise as much of our own food and manage our life that way. So do you have a lineage uh, in your family of farmers or did you guys kind of learn this as you went? We're definitely learning as we go. Um, it's not all so easy. Uh, we have 35 acres. And I mean, if I could go to class, what I the class I'd probably go to at this point is how to manage 35 acres without those. Because when you call, let's say you have, we, we have a lot of mullein, we have, anyway, you have all these weeds. And when you call the county extension, they just say, oh, come get this, you know, this drug. That, I mean, that's, that's, you know, it's just like calling the vet or the doctor and they say, well, to take an antibiotic and, you, you know, you want to manage the land differently. So, no, we don't really come from that. Um, you know, we read and do what we can. And um, Montana isn't exactly the mecca of doing it natural. Um, some cities in Montana are, but where we are, I feel like is pretty conventional. So we are figuring a lot of stuff out as we go. Oh, that's great. So have you noticed any health improvements since you started growing a lot of your own vegetables and you're, you're having, you know, eating off the land, so to speak, have you noticed any changes in you or your husband's health you know, since starting to really take that seriously? So disappointingly, I think I'd have to say no, but it also maybe hasn't been long enough. So um, in that five years, we've just have the cows you know I mean that's kind of a process to get cows and start keeping and eating your own it takes two years to raise a steer to where you can butcher them and you know um, and then pretty serious gardening the last three years so it has tremendous benefits in terms of saving money we know we buy heirloom organic seeds from rareseeds.com and you know but I don't I mean if we weren't doing that we're we're just we're still buying organic at the grocery store so I don't know if I feel better eating our own food, except emotionally. 
Yeah, because it's a labor of love and mm-hmm. you're putting all that effort into it. That's great. So uh, any tips for people before we get into SIBO? For people that maybe are curious about growing their own vegetables, maybe having some chickens and starting out small, you know, any tips or resources or uh, websites or, you know, words of wisdom that you could share with them? Well, I think anybody can do a raised bed. I I almost don't care where you live. Anybody can do a raised bed, even if it's only two feet by two feet. And you can make your own soil, which is what we did for our raised bed. So you take, you start out with cardboard or newspaper and put in leaves and twigs and uh, leaves and twigs. Oh, because we have cows, we put some manure in. And, but you know, whatever the size of it is, you can grow all of the salad you want for a summer in two feet by two feet, because you just keep replanting every couple of weeks. So So I think anybody can grow a few things and chickens, a lot of cities allow you to have three to sometimes 10 chickens, as long as you don't have a rooster. Um, And then you get to use the chicken poo for fertilizer and it makes great fertilizer. So we're, we're new to the chickens, but we are harvesting chicken poo. We have a method of capturing it all. And uh, so I've made a bucket of slimy stuff. (laughs) Yummy. I, I go pour on my, you know, all the squash and anyway, we'll see. But um, I, I guess I would say anybody can do something. Everybody can do something, you know, whether it's a tomato plant, a pepper plant, um, share chickens with a neighbor, you know, but I, I think we all could be a little better in charge of our food supply. Great tip, sir. All right. So let's talk about SIBO. You've been studying SIBO for quite some time. A lot of people seek you out for you know small intestinal right. bacteria overgrowth treatment. Uh, maybe give us a little bit of an overview. We've talked about it, Tracy, a little bit on the show and in different segments from different right. practitioners, but give us your take on what SIBO is and the different types of SIBO, if you will. Sure. So SIBO is an overgrowth of bacteria in the lower small intestine typically. So a lot of people don't know that the small intestine really should be almost sterile. There's virtually no bacteria residing in there, 10 to the third. Um, When we talk about the microbiome and the gut flora, we're really talking about the large intestine. And I'm not really sure if the average consumer gets that, that we're talking about, you know, almost two different you know, it is two different organs, I guess, or, uh, you know, at least pieces of anatomy. So that small intestine should be sterile for a variety of reasons, which I think we'll talk about. The colonic bacteria, the large intestine bacteria can migrate up into the small intestine. I explain it to my patients like this. It's like mom and dad are gone. The kids invite a few friends over. It turns into a massive keg party. Nobody gets their work done because, you know, the small intestine is where we should be doing our digestion and absorption. So when everybody's having a party in the small intestine, nobody's digesting and absorbing your food. So we now know that there's two types of small intestine bacterial overgrowth. There's SIBO hydrogen. Those people tend to have a fast transit time and loose stools. We have SIBO methane. Those people have slow transit time. They're maybe only having a bowel movement a couple times a week, every other day. God forbid, once a week, but something like that. And they also might have those hard, compacted little stools. So now that we know we have two types, there's also two different treatment uh, protocols for that. SIBO hydrogen gets one antibiotic. SIBO with methane, whether it's hydrogen and methane or just methane, gets double antibiotic therapy. So, you know, I'm sure we're going to talk about some of the things that go wrong in this, but, but there are two types. They do have different treatments almost like type one and type two diabetes. They're, they're different entities on some level. So, um, so it's an overgrowth and the work's not getting done and it wreaks havoc. Um, you know, we're all trained that if the gut's not working well, then you end up with brain symptoms, you have fatigue, you can have joint pain because the gut is now spilling out those endotoxins. They get into the bloodstream and they go everywhere from head to toe. So people really, they have this plethora, but people can, there can be a very textbook case and it's very easy to identify if you know what to look for. Great overview there. And, and if we could talk about some of the causes, um, we've had Stephen Samberg Lewis on, I think it was episode number eight. And so he talked about different medications, popcorns, opiates, uh, stress, and so forth, um, working with clients and, and so on. Uh, what have you found to be kind of the top offenders or when you're going through someone's, you know, using the functional medicine matrix and digging into their story, what have you right. found that you feel are the top offenders or, you know, lifestyle yeah. factors that contribute to SIBO development? Right. Definitely not a one size fits all. So Pimentel has showed in the research that stress can contribute to, but in military studies where people are highly stressed and have PTSD, uh, but they don't necessarily get SIBO. So foodborne illness is now known to cause 25% of SIBO. So meaning you get food poisoning. 
Uh, stress can contribute. I see and look for head injuries. Um, a lot of that comes from Datis's work, Datis Karazan, and I think you've had him on too. But if your brain's not working, guess who tells your gut what to do? You know, so you have to look for that brain stuff. So head injuries, falling off a horse, falling down the stairs. Even if you were three, these are, you know, I did have a patient who has a lifelong SIBO. She fell down the stairs at two or three or something. She's been constipated her whole life. And you can't miss that in a history because that really can be a reason. She could have damaged her head, the vagus nerve. It drives motility all these years. Um, I think low hydrochloric acid can certainly be a player of PPIs, you know, so we're in an epidemic. It's usually in the top three of, of drugs being prescribed. So too many people are on um, a proton pump inhibitor, poor diet. <laughs> Can't miss that right as a nutritionist that, um, and I personally have to wonder what genetically modified food and pesticides and herbicides do in all of this. There is no research that I know of that indicate those, but you have to wonder if this becomes either a brain disorder where your brain can't drive the gut or it becomes a gut disorder, what do we do all day? That's a little bit like saying food doesn't have anything to do with your Crohn's to say that GMOs don't have anything to do with SIBO. That's just a Tracyism, but it feels like, you know, if we're wrecking our gut and wrecking motility or whatever, that that, that you know, that's just... Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I'm fascinated to kind of explore this brain, this kind of top-down approach and a little bit further. I know you want to kind of talk about that towards the end and so forth, but I think that's a great point to kind of launch from because like you said, I mean, who hasn't had some sort of small accident that maybe we brushed off or our parents brushed off or, you know, from football and sports and gosh, I've hit my head a, a million times. I used to race motorcycles. And so what sort of maybe assessment modalities or and or treatments would you offer for brain-based therapies to help people kind of restore that vagal nerve and, and get the gut-brain axis functioning properly? So in my mind, Atisa sort of started that. I'm really thankful that, that he's done that. But so, you know, he I'm not a physician, but so he talks about um, assessing for bowel tones, um, looking at the palate and the arches in the back of the, you know, you open your mouth and say, ah, and, and looking at those because the the palate is filed by fired by the vagus nerve, and so so you would see those either lopsided or not firing at all. But but let, let's do uh, let's make sure the listeners understand what the vagus nerve is. So the vagus nerve comes out of the head, comes down behind the ears, kind of comes back behind your throat. It's part of speech, goes down, you know, sort of joins up as one, and then turns into this mesh that's I think of like a big spider web, and it encapsulates and surrounds the heart and almost the entire digestive tract starts in the stomach, small intestine, I believe goes about halfway through the large intestine. So when that, that's what we have, to, that's what people need to understand is that when you and I are talking as educated people about the brain gut access, that's what we're talking about is that that vagus nerve has a, a critical role. So, so Datis has, has opened the door about gargling, gagging, coffee enemas, um, acetyl carnitine was discussed in this year's SIBO symposium because uh, the the vagus nerve is an acetylcholine based nerve, and then um, one person mentioned lion's mane. It's a mushroom, and it also has some nerve regenerative properties. So. I am having my people do that. I mean, I think we're just now on the brink of figuring out whether people do have vagus dysfunction. I sort of assume all my patients have some vagus dysfunction and that they could all stand to do some gargling and gagging. And if they want to venture into coffee enemas, um, most people with SIBO do have cognitive dysfunction and acetylcarnitine works great for brains. And now we have kind of this double mechanism where it's a, you know, it has two benefits, um, just helps the brain fire and also helps that vagus nerve fire. So I am doing a lot of that in my practice to try to address that because as you may be known, as a lot of people who are going to end up watching this know, a lot of people have SIBO and they treat and retreat and retreat ad nauseum. And we have to start thinking about, A, what caused it? Um, is it the vagus nerve? Is it, you know, all the other things? Or um, And how to fix those and not just keep giving people herbs or antibiotics or whatever for the rest of their life. 
Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because that's a common question that I get all the time and and uh, through email and through people that I interact with and so forth online is, is um, people have been on the antibiotics, whether they're the Zyfaxin or Rifaximin and or Berberine and herbs and peppermint and and um, still have not received you know a beneficial improvements. They're still symptomatic. So I love these very practical and inexpensive brain-based approaches to really restore that uh, brain gut access, which is great. I think anyone can benefit from um you know, firing their vagal nerve, you know, even if you don't have SIBO, I mean, there's a lot of research showing that vagal nerve activation is great for um, helping to keep the integrity of the gut there and helping to improve digestion and motility and also even weight loss, believe it or not, in autism. So there's some research using vagal nerve therapy for autistic children. So mm -hmm. fantastic. And what have you found, if we could kind of go into like heart math and, and stress-based reduction, mind-body therapies, mm -hmm. have you found that to be helpful in the context of SIBO and gut health? So I try to get people to do that and I have the little heart math gizmo and do my best to get in the green zone, right? But um, it, that's a, feels like a work in progress. Now, Dr. Pimentel says that the ICC nerves that, that are in charge of innervation for the migrating motor complex, again, we sort of dived ahead here, but, but that those can replasticize in three weeks. So let's break that down. So we've got the brain, the vagus, and then the vagus fires. I probably don't have all this right. I'm not a neurologist, but the vagus to maybe the interstitial cells of Cajal and, and those fire the migrating motor complex. And all of that is part of motility, right? So if those are damaged, whether that's food poisoning, a head trauma, maybe Lyme disease and autonomic dysfunction. But if, if those are damaged, that we can replasticize that. And what that means is that if you have a tree here and these are its branches and this is a tree in its branches, a nerve fires its neurotransmitter. It goes across that synaptic gap and then it gets picked up by the other one. So that's what we're talking. When a nerve fires, somebody literally fires the nerve fires, the neurotransmitter comes across, it gets picked up here. Replasticizing, if this gets broken, whether it's Alzheimer's or, you know, that, that head injury, if this gets broken, if it doesn't go too long, these can regrow and it can find another way over to reconnect. And that's what happens if somebody has a stroke and they have to learn how to walk or talk again, that's replasticizing those nerves. And so I don't even remember where we were going with that, but, but that's we were going with uh, it takes, I think, three weeks to get the vagal nerve to replasticize. Yes, right, right. So I am having people do that. Most of my patients, I feel like, no disrespect to them, but I feel like they maybe don't take that seriously. They think, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you just want me to gag and gargle and, and, and you know, you do your best to convey all of this, but I don't, you know, I, I do, I think it's a big deal. I think it, um, sometimes you have to hit that rock bottom before you start to do all of this. So if you've been on antibiotics three times and you're eating to the letter and you're doing everything right, you have to start thinking out of the box and thinking about these other mechanisms that are involved. Maybe that's what it takes before people start doing heart math and deep breathing, you know, whether it's with or without the gizmo. And just for, for science, let's just make sure everybody understands that if you're in stress, fight or flight mode, you're decreasing secretory IgA. And here's the analogy I give my patients. If you're in the woods and you had a nice picnic lunch and here comes a grizzly bear, do you think you're going to worry about digesting your food or do you think you're going to worry about running away from the bear? Well, of course, you're going to run away from the bear and so that food just sits there and ferments and you know and you decrease secretory iga so stress really is a big player maybe that's why SIBO is such an epidemic even outside of all of pimentel's research if it's such a predisposing factor who's not stressed these days you know even retired oh. people are too busy so what does that tell you yeah, no, I completely agree with that. And I, I, I think the buy-in is tough for the mind-body stuff because uh, it takes a lot of dedication and practice and the effects are not so immediate. You know, sometimes when you take a supplement or herb or a pharmaceutical, you can notice the results right away, you know, and uh, and it's more of a passive, you know, modality, if you will. I mean, you're swallowing a capsule or a pill or something along those lines. But the mind-body mm -hmm. stuff, I think... Um, has the best long-term effects i've noticed through my own health doing heart math and meditation right. um, yep. i i love supplements i take a lot of supplements but uh, i think that is the one thing that i would never want to give up because the effects are so profound but right. 
it took me a while to be dedicated to that. So I can see why some people may resist that. But if you're listening to this and you've been fighting it, uh, I would suggest starting there, you know, because I think it's the most powerful research really right. shows that. So, um, right. and back to the stress thing, you know, you, you hit on secretory IJ and digestion. And I just wanted to highlight for folks, you know, about bile and how antimicrobial bile acids are and how they help to keep, you know, bacteria out of the small intestine. And so bile is one of those digestive products, as you know, Tracy, that's going to be uh, the secretion of which will be diminished during times of stress. So uh, you have this, all these things going in the wrong direction when you're stressed. And so right. I like that idea of just gargling and, and calming down even before a meal, if you don't make that your therapy can really help you digest your food. Um, so and let's not forget, you asked me about risk factors, but having your gallbladder removed is a risk factor for SIBO because it changes bile flow. Interesting. I didn't know that. So I guess we didn't really talk about assessment. So you're seeing a lot of people, you know, virtually and so forth. How are you assessing SIBO? Or are you having them you know, ship a test or go to a treatment center? Can you talk about that? I can do both. So I, somebody signs for me and I can do the lacteal's breath test. I also work really hard to work with providers. I feel like it's just like if you have your daughter come help you make uh, broccoli in the kitchen, she's going to be more likely to eat it, right? So if a, if a you know, if I see this and I can have the provider, doctor, nurse, practitioner, whatever, um, order the lactulose breath test, then they're a lot more inclined to be on the team when it comes to treatments. So I write plenty of letters. Um, but so the answer is both. I can, I can both order it and, um, and I can also, you know, send them back and it's really a case by case basis. Um, sure. Okay. Fantastic. So uh, let's talk about food. You know, I know you work with people a lot about, you know, getting off uh, FODMAPs and, and more simple carbohydrates, I think, but, um, and maybe prebiotics, probiotics, people get really confused. Should I totally avoid fermentable carbs? Should I avoid prebiotics? Like share with us, you know, some of the dietary recommendations to avoid SIBO. And if you have it, how can it improve your, your gut? Okay. So A, you can't fix SIBO unless you do either a low FODMAP diet or the combo that Dr. Seebecker put together, low FODMAP and specific carbohydrate. What we're trying to do is reduce the fuel that the little bugs have to eat. So it at least has to be low FODMAP. A lot of people have lost the ability to digest disaccharides. So that combination, that that is what I use. It's more extreme, more restrictive, but you're going to get better results if people eat off those left two columns, the green and the yellow column off that Dr. Seebecker handout. So A, you have to do the diet. I, I have a huge opinion at this point, and, and my opinion, you know, over the five years I've studied SIBO, I've certainly learned a lot, and I've you know, anybody who I helped five years ago, I've probably changed my methods, but I no longer believe that we should be using pre or probiotics for SIBO until we know if their migrating motor complex works. Hmm. So this maybe is a great time to talk about that smart pill because um, that's how we're going to know if their migrating motor complex is working. But, but just to make sure people understand, you know, people are going to come from all different levels. If you don't have good motility and migrating motor complex is like a sweeper in the small intestine. And you can actually have good motility. You could be having five bowel movements a day, but the migrating motor complex can be broken and you're not sweeping out all the garbage at the end of the day. So if that migrating motor complex is not working and you are giving pre or probiotics, you're just feeding the fire that you've tried to put out. So I have a huge thing about that right now. And I see it all the time. I see people on Instagram and Facebook saying, I'm seeing somebody for SIBO and I'm on BSL three. And I just think, are you kidding? You know, I mean, for a while, maybe you're going to outnumber the bad bacteria and all the stuff in there, but um, it, it doesn't hold up yet until we know about the migrating motor complex. Hmm. So let's talk about the smart pill. I'm curious now. Okay, fast. Uh, we're living in um, the future, back to the future, I guess. Um, so it's capsule technology. I think this is just so cool. Um, so you go to the doctor's office. You don't have to do any barium studies anymore, no dyes or anything like that. You eat a bar. The bar does have some gluten in it, which I was disappointed to find out because that's going to be difficult for some people. But you eat a bar. For some reason, that has something to do with how this carries through the digestive tract. You take this little capsule, you either wear a lanyard or a little clip on your belt, and now that, that capsule that you've just swallowed travels all the way through you, leaves in a couple days, just how you think it's going to leave, and it's going to monitor your pH. So we're going to find out about 
if you have adequate or uh, insufficient hydrochloric acid, it's going to monitor pressure. So we're going to find out, especially about that ileocecal valve that separates the large and small intestine. Uh, it measures transit time, both from the, the entire transit time plus segment to segment. So we're going to find out what the transit time of the small intestine is. And But in the end, you're going to, you're going to have that a lot of that data, and it is predictive. So Dr. Mullen just presented on it at the SIBO Symposium. Johns Hopkins is offering it. It is now being covered by some insurance companies in, and Medicare, which I think is amazing. Um, and it's predictive that if you have low pH or high pH, if you have an alkaline pH, if you have slow transit time, if you don't have enough pressure between, you have kind of a sloppy ileocecal valve, um, you are either at risk for SIBO or at high risk. You know, let's say you've treated SIBO and it keeps coming back. This is going to help you identify if it's Lyme disease and co-infections and autonomic dysfunction. Do you have a vagus nerve injury? Do you have hydro, you know, low hydrochloric acid? I mean, that's all going to dictate future treatment. If it's a vagus nerve injury, then you need to do your gagging and gargling. If it's Lyme, you're going to need to work on Lyme stuff. And if it really is low, you know, alkaline uh, pH, um, and you don't have enough hydrochloric acid, maybe you're 70 years old and got SIBO and it's just part of aging, your your therapy moving forward is going to be to take hydrochloric acid with your meals because it's antibacterial. So what we've done so far is kind of lump everybody into the same bucket. And we, it, I feel like the easy part is to identify that somebody has SIBO and even the easy part is to give them antibiotics or herbs. The hard part is to figure out, did you get this because of you know, five or 10 different mechanisms. Is this stress? You need to do heart math. Um, not that, again, that I think that that's the only, at least from Pimentel's research, stress alone won't won't give you SIBO. But I feel like if you're at risk, maybe you don't have a great microflora because you were a C-section baby or, you know, or you had a lot of as a kid or all those things that wreck you. maybe you're at risk because of some microflora issues already and now you're under a lot of stress yes then maybe you know anyway there is definitely more research coming all the time yeah and that smart pill sounds fascinating so it's just johns hopkins you said or is it available well, I don't know. yep i don't know what other centers are offering it yet so after the SIBO symposium i went online found kind of a a website for it, frequently asked questions. It's how I learned that they have this gluten-free bar. And I'm now on a mission to find out what other centers offer this. Wow. But I don't I don't know that. And I'm sure you need to go see a gastroenterologist to do it. And um, it's kind of, it's gonna, definitely going to be the cutting edge technology. But I think it's really cool that you just take a little capsule and we're going to get a lot of data out of that, you right. know. And if people are failing treatment over and over, you really have to look at this. That's a big deal. Yeah, we hear about the failing treatment. So just to summarize, the smart pill can assess the root cause of your SIBO and figure out, you know, is it a digestive issue or motility issue? Is it this dysfunctional migrating motor complex, which causes motility? Is that what the migrating motor complex does? It's going to tell you transit time. I don't actually know, since this is so new, if it's going to tell you that the migrating motor complex is broken or it's the vagus nerve probably somebody smarter than me can address that, but it is at least going to tell you transit time. And mm -hmm. that alone is, is a risk factor. Okay. So uh, you tackled some of the diet stuff and you mentioned um, Dr. Seebecker's, I think it was a handout or cheat sheet. Where can people find that? Uh, the, the guide that I use was available in both SIBO symposium. I've downloaded it. I share it with my patients. I'm a hundred percent certain that it's on her website, SIBOinfo.com. Um, it's, you know, so you know you found the right one. It's got four columns. It's green, yellow, orange, and red. And it, as you move to the right of the page, foods become more fermentable or just plain off limits because of how fermentable they are. So I typically have my patients eat the first two columns, which is SCD safe and lower on the fermentable list. And again, we just don't want to feed the little bacteria. So we want to keep that fermentation down. Absolutely. That's great. So I'll and put that in the show notes as well at highintensityhealth.com slash Tracy. So you guys can check that out and learn more about Tracy's work and her website. So we have the right uh, right hand out there. So Tracy, let's kind of talk about herbs. So if someone gets their test back, maybe they've worked with a clinician before. What are some of the top herbs uh, for the different types of SIBO that you found to be most effective? So that's been really different, but berberine, um, but not everybody. I have a couple of people who have not tolerated berberine. I often use neem. I really am sort of following who I think the experts are. So um, Sandberg Lewis and Seebecker, 
So berberine neem, um, I use the ADP oregano from Biotics um, at pretty high doses. And if they have methane, they really have to do garlic. They're just, I've not been successful treating a SIBO methane patient without using garlic. So we're, they're either going to have to get used to garlic or we have other options like going to the antibiotics. Um, and some people don't even handle the herbs. They definitely don't want antibiotics. And so, you know, for some, I've played around with some things like biocidin, uh, which is a liquid antimicrobial. Um, kind of on my radar is the Designs for Health Silver Psyllin. Um Essential oils are on my radar, uh, like doTERRA or Young Living. I'm familiar with doTERRA's line, but they have a digestin or oregano or, you know, um, even ginger. But I feel like those are more powerful. And personally, I get really sick of telling people to take pills. Um, that kind of goes two ways. People, you know, it, sometimes it's like we've just substituted drugs for pills and that isn't necessarily my favorite thing to do. So I love the idea of essential oils. Of course, there's no data, um, but I am using it and suggesting it more either with other things or as a last resort. If somebody fails, they just, you know, so if you go down that whole methylation pathway, if CB, if people are homozygous for the CBS 699, even if you give them molybdenum, I do not find that they do that great with massive doses of garlic. And so you do have to kind of come up with some other options to try to help people through this. Sure. Okay. Oh, you know, another option that I want to talk about, I have not done this, but um, just presented at the SIBO Symposium as a third option, really, in all of this, the third good option is the elemental diet. I have never you know, there just hasn't been maybe enough data on it. But so they did a lactulose breath test before, did two weeks of an elemental diet, which means they're only doing amino acids, there's no food. And then you do some uh, fat and carbohydrate source with it. It's just kind of a nasty tasting shake that you drink, you know, three or five times a day, you do it for two weeks. But because there's no fuel, there's no carrots, even though they're, you know, low on the FODMAP, no cucumbers, they had remarkable follow up tests, like it was as effective as antibiotics or herbs, like the data presented this year was very, very good. So I'm definitely looking at that as an option for people. Um, you can do Vivonex, V-I-V-O-N-E-X, which is about $1,000. And Dr. Seebecker is so passionate about all of this. She figured out a formula to be able to, for people to be able to make it, to just buy the amino acids, buy their own dextrose, and you can use whatever kind of oil you want, olive oil, coconut oil, whatever. And, um, and it's a couple hundred dollars. I have looked it up and I don't have any takers on it yet, but I think it's a serious option, you know, and a lot less money than all these herbs and antibiotics cost even. So Right. And then you're you're done, theoretically or hopefully. I mean, depending upon your lifestyle and I guess migraine emoto complex and some of the root cause issues. But what, from what I've heard from Steven Sandberg Lewis is he's getting great results with that. And like you said, after two weeks, most people are really improved. So two weeks of just sticking to this cowboy up and just get her done, get her right? done. <laughs> i like that approach okay so talk to us uh, if you would tracy about some of the antimicrobial compounds uh, when it comes to pharmaceuticals for faxman zyfax and i know some there's some different details about you know where each one of those is different you know how it works and in, in the efficacy so you want to break that down for us a little bit so first of all it's important to know that zyfaxin is the brand um usa and it's $1,250, or it was, and it's not been indicated for IBS until early June. It's now FDA approved. So for people listening, if they have IBS diarrhea, or what we would call sebohydrogen, if um, Zyfaxin is now approved through insurance for them to do that. Um, Zyfaxin is pretty special in that it stays in the small intestine, so it's not absorbed. It can't cause a yeast infection, can't cause a UTI. Um, and Dr. Pimentel presented this year that they've done before and after deep sequencing and Zyfaxin leaves the microbiome intact. It's because it only works in the small intestine. It needs a bile to activate it. So once it hits the large intestine, it crystallizes, dissipates, and it's gone. And in deep sequencing, they showed 98% of the microbiome was still just the way it was before you did the antibiotics. So I know antibiotics get another bad rap, but I think another important point is that this is not your normal antibiotic. This isn't Cipro or 
you know, one of those kind of antibiotics. Um, it, Zyfaxin also prevents other drugs that it's used with, other antibiotics, from creating resistance. So, again, Pimentel has studied all this. Um, he really, he's the top dog. He's the, the one who figures all this stuff out. Um, but if you give Zyfaxin with, let's say, neomycin or Zyfaxin with Cipro, metronidazole, it prevents those from becoming resistant and losing their potency. So it's really, given that SIBO is an epidemic and we have something that works on it, it feels like kind of a big gift that, that you know, we're not doing more damage. Antibiotics can create SIBO, but antibiotics can also fix it. Basically what I infer from that, it's a little bit more effective for the hydrogen producing or the hydrogen dominant SIBO. Is that it? Well, or if you have methane, then you do Zyfaxin um, plus either neomycin or flagyl, which is metronidazole. Um, I'm friends with a functional medicine doc, and she has taught me to not use flagyl, or to eat, not, no, I'm not prescribing it, but to not ask a doctor for flagyl, and instead ask for either tinidazole, or you can get compounded tindamax, those are the same, um, just because fewer side effects. And we, we still want to do as little harm as we can in the, in the treatment of this. So to be clear, if you have SIBO hydrogen, you get just Zyfaxin, but if you have SIBO methane or hydrogen and methane, you need both. You, you need that Zyfaxin no matter what, if you're going to do the, the drugs. Now, what's the duration of the drugs that you found or other people have found to be most effective? 14 days. It's now a pretty standard protocol to do 550 milligrams three times a day. I think it's important that that's not breakfast, lunch, and dinner, that that's breakfast, two o'clock, you know, 10 o'clock when you go to bed so that each pill has eight hours to work just so that, you know, because so many of us were taking supplements at breakfast, lunch, and dinner um, with food, but Zyfaxin can be taken away from food and it definitely needs its eight, eight hours to work. Is that what you meant in the question? Yeah. Oh yeah. And then duration total. So 14 days, oh, three 14 times days. a day. Mm -hmm. Right. And then it's really important to retest because here's what can happen. And I've had this happen. Somebody can now be clear of SIBO, but they're still symptomatic. But when you get that lactulose breath test back and it says, well, the SIBO has gone, there's no hydrogen, methane, you know what I mean? Those are negative, but they still are having trouble. Now you have to go look for celiac disease, food sensitivities, gastroparesis, if they're still not emptying. Lyme disease, whatever it is, but you can clear those gases and people can still feel bad. I think it's really important to make sure that we're testing in between and not just going off symptoms. And early on, I was guilty of the same thing. It's like, oh, you're a textbook case for SIBO. But just last week, I saw a negative lactulose breath test, but a lot of dysbiosis in the large bowel. Well, she doesn't need the SIBO treatment. She needs to work on her large bowel. And, you know, and they're not the same. Since you brought that up, you have me curious, what, how would that treatment uh, perhaps be different or modified for sure. the large bowel, small bowel? Yeah. So, so the SIBO, that's a small bowel. That's what we've been talking about the whole time. This other patient, we're going to be working on fermented foods, um, chia and flax seeds for short chain fatty acids, uh, Saccharomyces boulardii to help her secretory IgA. Uh, I don't think she had a lot of inflammation. Diversity, you probably know this better than I do, but her diversity was really low. And I don't feel like I know exactly how, if somebody's lost the, the species, granted you can eat those probiotic rich foods, but I don't really know if they're gonna camp out and make a home there. But but that's that's where we head is to, to start eating fibers, diverse diet. I mean, that, that's kind of your forte now. Right, right. Yeah. But it, it's interesting, Dr. Vincent Pedre was just on the show, and he's the author of The Happy Gut. And so he does a lot of stool testing uh, for various patients of his in Manhattan. And he found that um, it was a couple that came in eating the same diet, they were eating the same foods. Um, you know, both were mildly symptomatic. I think the wife, if I remember, was a little bit more symptomatic and had a little bit more GI upset and so forth. But the uh, bacterial diversity was completely different um, in their their stool test. And so of course, you could look at maybe testing methodology and split samples and all that. But he you know, trusted the lab that he worked with and basically attributed it to early life experiences, like we talked about C-section and breastfeeding and antibiotic exposure and so forth. So um, I don't know what the, what the approach is. I mean, in theory, you eat a more diverse diet, more vegetables, more tubers, and you can increase the diversity that way. But you know, maybe for some people, it may be fecal microbiota transplantation, maybe the answer. Sure. Right, right, right. Or, yeah, I heard that interview and uh, she had ulcerative colitis and was much more symptomatic, but they were both eating the SCD diet and and his looked great and hers didn't look so great. And, 
you know, I, don't, I feel like we have some answers and yet we don't know, you know, for smart as we are, we got a long way to go still. Yeah, no, that's interesting. Great, Tracy. Well, before we go to final questions, anything about SIBO or the gut or gut brain axis that you would like to share that we didn't get to discuss? I think I have one thing, maybe more. Well, so if we're going to, I don't know if we fully talked about outside of the box things. We haven't talked about adhesions. So pretty interesting to me is that when people fail, they've done the SIBO treatment and their, their drug of choice. And if they fail fairly quickly, Dr. Pimentel says that you have to really think about adhesions. They did a nice little segment at this year's SIBO symposium about adhesions. They most commonly, of course, come after surgery, but you can also just get them from trauma, like we were talking about um, inflammation and infection. So if you have that inflamed gut, perhaps you just can create adhesions. I, certainly not my specialty, but kind of on my radar. And I think people need to think about that. And the other thing that I see so commonly is that we're all trained in functional medicine to treat the gut, treat the gut, treat the gut. And I love that Detis says, don't forget who's in charge of the gut and to really think about that brain gut access. The brain talks to the gut. It becomes that vicious circle because if your gut becomes a sludgy pond, then it's of course making those endotoxins and going to the brain and given, you know, now you have a two way street of gut brain and brain gut access. But I think that's really critical to, to not just assume to, to really think about the root causes and where this all came from. I think it's, it just can't be understated. And again, I feel like the easy part is to say you have SIBO and let's pick, you know, an elemental diet or herbs or uh, your antibiotics. But the hard part is to really, to start doing antibody testing, smart pills, motility studies, looking for adhesions, you know, it, this is, it's a big deal. So yeah. anyway, yeah. yeah. That's great. I have a friend, Dave Peterson. He's a chiropractic physician uh, in the California area. And we met back in 2010 and he was talking about adhesions back then and has a whole, I think he's publishing a book, I think this summer actually on adhesions. And I never heard anyone else talk about it besides you and him. So um, mm, I think that's a huge, totally under, you know, recognized, but critical aspect. And yeah done some research in, in the gut about creeping fat. And so we know that people with inflammation tend to have a lot of fat just on the adjacent side of the epithelium and mucosal layers and so forth. And it starts to build up and around. So, you know, if you do have dysbiosis, small intestinal bacteria, overgrowth, motility issues, and maybe sit a lot, have a little bit of visceral fat. So your intestines are being crunched, then we can get these adhesions and those can really affect motility. And so he has a lot of research on this and has worked mm -hmm. with gastroenterologists and it's fascinating stuff. And he was way ahead of this. So if you guys are right. wanting to learn more about that, he's coming on the show in August. And so we'll dive into that. Read his book because I don't think I quite understand the mechanism in my head. It seems like it must be sort of like a pea trap under your kitchen sink where the intestine comes and then kind of drops down and comes back up or something. But beyond that, I can't really figure out I just, I don't know how adhesions really are altering and contributing to this. I did write right away to my massage therapist and said, do you know how to assess for adhesions? Do you know how to fix them? Um, the people they had at the symposium were from Florida. Uh, their, their clinic is called Clear Passage, and they do a technique called the worm technique, W-U-R-N. I don't know what that is, but if you're a massage therapist, you can look it up. And I mean, I think what's going to need to happen is more people are going to be able to need to assess for this. Um, and doing a, a barium study, if I understand that right, really isn't done that accurately. So we don't have very good ways. I mean, it takes a very good radiologist who's willing to do 28 scans of each segment of the intestine as, as you go through and they have to use their paddle and move stuff around. And I guess that just isn't that, you know, when they do it correctly at Pimentel's place, but that's because he's in charge. If you just go to your run of the mill clinic and say, I want to find out if I adhesions, apparently they just give you a couple pictures and say, no, you don't have adhesions. And you know, anyway. and that's, that's not adequate according to the experts. So, yeah. Again, as a nutritionist, I have all these pieces, and sometimes my job is just to send people to the right places. Like, I have all the information, and it's kind of, I mean, I, I do know how to treat it all, either myself or, you know, send them back to their doctor, but sometimes they need to know go get a smart pill, go get, you know, 28 radiographs so that we know if you have adhesions, and, you know, anyway. 
Yeah. Great information there, Tracy. But I think, you know, for people that are listening, and I think all of us may be susceptible to adhesions based upon what I've, you know, heard from Dr. Peterson and so forth. But so I think the kind of the bottom line is maybe have prevention and so forth. I think, I think standing is great, reducing your belly fat through exercise and, and moving your core a lot. You know, I think that's to keep that creeping fat from, from you know, kind of sticking around. And you talked about the mechanism of how does it work? I think it's just that inflammatory matrix there just starts to kind of congeal. Again, I could be wrong on this, but that's what uh, uh, Dr. Peterson has said. And so he uses things like uh, proteolytic enzymes. He's found to be pretty effective in different enzymes to help break things up. Um, so anyway, we'll, we'll learn more about that. So Tracy, um, we have a couple of questions here. Did Sorry, go ahead. Um, no, they didn't really elaborate in, you know, in this year's presentation. They just said they don't really unadhere all on their own. And, and like it was only this manipulation that you could really get them to do that. So I'm definitely open to learning more about that. Interesting. Yeah, I think one of the enzymes, serapeptidase, it's a silkworm-derived enzyme. It has some great research mm -hmm. for breaking up uh, mucin and, and different, you know, um, uh, you know, soft tissue, um, inflammatory, you know, type, uh, you know, congestion, I guess it would be the right word. So anyway, you can check that out. Serapeptase is, is the enzyme. So Tracy, um, with a couple of final questions here. What's your morning routine like? We know that very successful people oh. have routines and <laughs> do things. So share with us your ideal morning, what that looks like. Well, ideally, it would take me till about 11 o'clock before I could be in my office. So A, I'm a big believer in just sleeping in until I feel like waking up. I'm super spoiled, but I don't have to commute. I don't have to usually get dressed up. So I usually wake up about 7 or 7.30. And I guess ideally, I'd like to do my heart math. I'd like to go to the garden and, and pick my greens and then do a green juice and um, cook some breakfast uh, exercise. I would, I do prefer to exercise in the morning. Um, but in the middle of all that, don't forget of the, about that 35 acres in the farm. So the chickens need to be fed in the morning and they need fresh water. And depending on the time of year, the cows need to be fed and, and either break their water or they need more water because it's hot. And so it's the one thing I could really work on. And you kind of taught us that in the class I did was that it's you know, it's that one thing you could do to really get your day off on the right foot is to do all those things. And I have yet to really sit down and say, like, in my head, I have this checklist of like, okay, I'm going to get up, I'm going to do 12 minutes of heart math, I'm going to, you know, do my stretching, do my workout. And you know what I mean? But I, I haven't got there yet. It's, um, it can be a little random. <laughs> Sure. I think that that is for everyone. But in an ideal world, yeah, you, you do all those things. But I think it's great that you're out there and, and getting some natural sun, which will help reset your circadian rhythm and keep it on track and having purpose and feeding animals that must make you feel really good and being outside and getting that fresh air and exercise. And that's awesome. So there was one herb nutrient or botanical, you know, that what's your favorite, maybe you're going on vacation, going on a, on a trip of some sort, what would you bring? And what do you recommend to your clients and patients? You know what? I maybe would pick a fresh green juice. I don't. You said herb nutrient, but I mean, why not food? Right? Could it it be could food? be. Yeah, it could be whole food or a anything. Just something that you feel that is. You know, there's just really. To, if you were to put your herb nutrients or botanicals or whole foods in a hierarchy, what's the one thing that you think is the most? So out of all the things I do and eat and drink, I feel like when I'm juicing every single day, green juices. I don't put any fruit in it, but just green stuff. Um, I feel like that's when I feel the best. So, um, and when I travel, I actually think about those kinds of things. Like I'll find a whole foods and either buy some fresh juices or, you know, whatever. But, but that is kind of the thing that I think about if I could do every single day, I, that would be great. Fantastic. I agree with that. Um, I, I feel much better if I put a, as I do smoothies, you know, with like uh, collards and uh, Swiss chard and spinach and stuff like that. And zucchini, I think that's a great way. The greens just make you feel so good. It's, and I don't think it's placebo. I think it really does affect acid balance and pH and, and all the phytonutrients there. So great info. Tracy. So final question, if there was a, you know, you were to bump shoulders with a future president or maybe Barack Obama in an elevator, uh, what sort of health or lifestyle tip would you want to bend his ear about and let him know maybe so that he could share with Americans and possibly influence some policy around what would that tip be and why? I could go on for a long time in an elevator, but I think we have to get to the root cause of things. Um, and we've got to get genetically modified food out of our food system. Um, 
I really resent that he campaigned against GMOs and it's eight years later and we still have him. And I just feel like in my gut that they're not eating genetically modified food in the White House. And yet we cannot pass a law here or get anybody to get off their duff about labeling genetically modified foods. Even if you don't care about them one way or the other, the people who do want to know, I, I just don't understand why we can't label GMOs. Um, and I, I think our whole healthcare system is broken. It's changing. The fact that we've got Cleveland Clinic, Texas now is doing some integrative or functional medicine in their their training. But I really do think I would bend their ear a little bit about how we 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 spend a lot of money chasing symptoms, and we're not really getting to um, the root causes. And um, I think it's why. If you do, if you are trained in functional medicine and you are willing to spend some time with people, that you end up with a waiting list in your practice because you know people want help and they can't get it conventionally. So yeah, people are craving it. Absolutely, <laughs> fantastic tip there, Tracy. So uh, I'm sure our listeners want to learn more about your work and where they connect with you online. So if you could give us your website and social media channels, that'd be great. Mm-hmm. So www.healthylifestylesmt for Montana.com. All the social media buttons are there, easy to find. Um, I do one-on-one patients, but I have a long waiting list. And just a couple of weeks ago, I took that little box even off my website because I just I can't keep up. So that's a little disappointing for people. But one thing I'm headed towards, I guess, is I'm doing more group classes as a result of that. Um So I have a few more free classes coming up. Um, By the time this gets edited and put out, there'll maybe be one more. Um, But I'm doing a free class on what is SIBO. Um, There's information on my website. There's a purple and an orange bar. And on the orange bar, it says free. Well, that's where you can sign up for free classes. So I'm doing a free class on SIBO. Really encouraging people if they're in that, I don't know what I have. I just know I'm sick to go get a lactulose breath test if the the shoe fits. And then starting to do more of this in a group fashion because... Although medicine needs to be individualized and personalized, 80% of what I tell people is going to be the same. And then I'm encouraging people just to do what I call Ask Tracy sessions to to kind of personalize it. Um, But it really, you know, it it lets me help more people at one time. So so anyway, that's my website. And that's kind of where I'm headed is that... um, you can't keep up if you, you know, if you stay up with the research and are really trying to do stuff. And I don't mean that at all. I I say that trying to be very humble. It's just true that I'm sure you see this too, that if people are really good at what they do, you end up with a big waiting list and and then you have to turn to other measures in order to try to continue to help people because you can't just keep throwing one sandfish into the ocean, (laughs) you know, (laughs) when there's 10,000 of them. Yeah. Yeah. There's so many people that need help and people like you who are constantly learning and growing are, are hard to find. So people are going to seek you out and and so forth. So Tracy, thank you so much for coming on the show. Love talking with you about this, you know, emerging topic of small intestinal bacteria overgrowth. You shared a lot of fascinating tips. So keep up the good work. Yay. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for having me. This was, this was great.